there. If you would, please. We will be looking at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 this morning. Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. I'm like Mr. Rogers. I change clothes in between sets, right? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. This is a great deal of text, but I'm very happy to read it for you. It says, What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So, you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead... Offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Let's pray together. Lord, we are happy to be here on this beautiful Easter morning. I pray that we have gathered with the purpose celebrating King Jesus and his victory over Satan and over the grave. Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to be at work. Turn our hearts in your direction. Draw us closer to you. Pull us into salvation. Bring us into growth. Help us be more like Jesus. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with me as I proclaim your word, elaborate on it, help people understand it, and I pray that they are eager to do what it says, have a change of mind, a renewal of their faith. Lord, let us all strive to be faithful to you and remove ourselves from sin. Lord, help First Baptist continue to grow in every sense of the word and be mindful of preaching the gospel to our neighbors and looking and helping them in their time of need. Let us love you. Let us love our neighbor. Bring in the community to us so that we might make disciples of them. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks these days are really interested in their ancestry. I am, in my father's side of the family, my father actually did a great deal of work to figure out where the Millers came from. This might surprise you, but we were not discovered underneath a rock, okay? But he did a lot of work, and he come to find out that his great-grandfather, I might be wrong, it might be his grandfather, 
originally came from Greece. And that there was at one point in which he migrated over to Canada. And if I remember correctly, he came in to the United States by coming into Indiana. I'm not sure of all the details, but he originally had a Greek sounding name that sounded pretty foreign. During that time, foreigners were not well welcomed. And so to hide the fact that he was foreign, he changed his name. He changed his name to George Miller, right? Because that sounds very American, doesn't it? Sounds pretty typical. Now, we like these stories. We like looking up where we came from because when we look at our ancestors, our forefathers, what we like to think is that their story is somehow our story that we see ourselves in them, that we can identify and relate to them, and it brings us a great deal of joy to be part of something. Now that's all well and good. I encourage you to do that sometimes. It's fun. It's fascinating. But this morning what I want to talk about is Jesus, of course, and how his story is our story. That when we are in Christ, there are certain things that are true about him and therefore are true about us. Jesus Christ is the center of human history. Everything is by him, through him, and for him. The story of existence revolves around this supreme hero and he is worthy of our praise. Yes, we celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday, but we are to live our lives around that truth and celebrate it every single moment we are alive. And the great thing that we're going to be talking about this Easter Sunday is I'm going to demonstrate for you that his story is our story. And looking at this text, I see three ways in which that is true. Number one, his death is our death. His death is our death. Two, his resurrection is our resurrection. Keep that in mind. Although we are celebrating the past event of Christ's resurrection, but we are also looking forward to a future glorious resurrection of the saints. And then lastly, his life is our life. That more we learn about this, that we as Christians are to have the power of Christ living through us and with a new nature doing the things that he has commanded us. So again, his death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection, and his life is our lives. A couple of cool quotes I came across. One is by Michael Ramsey, and these are really punchy quotes. I like them. They're almost like Facebook posts. No resurrection, no Christianity. That's the heart of Christianity. I know a lot of people outside the church, they might see Christianity as a religion of do's and don'ts, and it's just a bunch of people who like to get together, and it's almost like a community club or something like that. But at the heart of everything that we do, it revolves around the truth of this. No resurrection, no Christianity. If Christ did not resurrect from the dead, there is no purpose to Christianity at all. That is where we are at. This is what we need to make sure that our churches revolve around this claim. Another quote, Clement of Alexandria, it says this, Christ has turned all our sunsets into dawns. We were just talking about that at our sunrise service this morning. It seems like God embedded into creation the idea of resurrection. That every night when the sun goes down, you can guarantee what's going to happen the next morning. The sun rises. 
I don't believe this is by accident. I don't believe that God creates the world in such a way and things coincidentally point to him. I believe that he did so with purpose and we are to be mindful of that. That God turns all of our sunsets into glorious dawns. And that is the truth of Christ and his resurrection. And so, again, his story is our story. Let's look at that first point I made. His death is our death. Verses 1 through 4. Paul asks some questions. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism and death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness and life. Now, in Paul's letters, when you read them, it is not uncommon for Paul to create fictional opponents. People who are listening to what he is saying, people who are reading what he is writing, and they might push back on him, have some type of opposition. And so every once in a while, Paul anticipates some type of objection to what he has said, and then he will pose it in the form of a question, and then will answer it for you. This is one of those moments. Paul has just made the argument, and pay attention to this, that salvation is not achieved by good works. Paul is spending a great deal at the beginning of his letter to demonstrate the people that faith is the foundation of our salvation, that it is not Good works, but it is by grace through faith. So if you walk out of here today saying, Preacher Seth told me that I have to work my way into heaven, you did not listen. Get the wax out of your ears. Pay attention. If you still are under the impression that Christianity teaches that God saves good people who do good works, you have misunderstood our faith altogether. So Paul makes it clear that you must have faith in God's good works, not your own. That you must trust in the grace of God and that you trust him and have faith in him. Now, upon hearing that, someone might object and say, Well, if good works does not save you, and if grace can simply bail you out, then that means we can sin all we want, right? That, that, that seems to be the argument that they are posing against God. If it has nothing to do with your good works, your behavior, or anything like that, and it's simply trusting in God's favor towards you, then you can do all that you want. Now, unfortunately, that's how some people inside the church do behave. Right? They come forward, they cry at the altar, make some type of confession, they get baptized a few weeks later, then they go back to their sinful lifestyle, thinking that they have did all that they can. And they're like, well, I I trusted in the Lord, right? I I had faith in everything that the preacher said, so that means I can live any way I want. God's grace is kind of like a safety net, and I can bounce around into it all that I want. To this, Paul says, absolutely not. That he goes against this objector saying, that's not how grace works. That is not the understanding of salvation. Now his reasoning is like this. How can we who died to sin still live in it? If allegedly you repented of your sins and now in your new nature hate sin, what in the world are you doing back in the mud again? Cannot do it. And he goes on, are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? In the next few weeks, we'll be doing a few baptisms here at First Baptist. And so I thought it would be important for us to have an understanding what baptism is all about. Baptism is a ceremony in which the candidate is declaring to the world that Jesus' death is their death. That I am up here letting you know that there's a part of me that is about to die. That I am dying and that his death is our death. 
My old self plunges into the waters, symbolically declaring that the death of my falling self, that I am dying to my old ways. And the thing is about baptism by immersion, there is the possibility of death, right? If you rub the pastor the wrong way during that week, he might hold you under a little bit longer than you want to. So there is a real reality there of an actual death possibly occurring. And so I won't do that. Timmy's here. I see him. He's strong. He's a candidate. So he's back there kind of squirming now. You're on my good side, Timmy. All right. And so when you are baptized, you are dying to your old ways. Christ plunged into death and my sin went with him. You understand that? When Christ was buried, my sin went with him. His death is our death. Therefore, Paul explicitly states, we were buried with him by baptism into death. Be aware of that about baptism, folks. It's just not a photo op. It's not just something so that you can say, look how cute my kid was getting baptized. It's not about that at all. It's not about just an elaborate ceremony in which you make things about yourself. It is you publicly declaring to the world that my old self is dead. That symbolically, when I go into that watery grave, there's a part of me that's not coming out alive. There is a part of me that has died, and I have died in Christ. And here we are given one of the reasons for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Why? Well, one of the reasons is so that we too may walk in newness of life. And so if we are walking in the newness of life, Paul says, how in the world are you still trying to walk in sin? That doesn't sound like someone who is walking in newness of life. It doesn't look like someone who's walking in newness of life. It looks like someone who's playing church. It's someone who's not growing into Christ. So Paul stresses this elsewhere. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's why Jesus stressed the idea of being born again. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. So we cannot long for those things, sin, when we have died to them. Because salvation, again, is not someone just turning themselves around, reforming themselves, but it is recreation. It is a new spirit. It is a new nature. Every once in a while in my house, we give dogs, my dogs, scraps from the dinner table. And every once in a while, we sit there and go, I wonder if our dog's going to like broccoli. I wonder if our dog's going to like green beans. So let's say for the evening we had hamburger, steak, mashed potatoes, green beans, and things like that. And we put all of that into the dog dish. We see her go over to the dish and eat it, slop it up and everything. And then when we go and check out to see what she has eating, guess what she has left behind? That dog ain't going to eat green beans, Right? That dog's not going to eat broccoli. That dog's not going to eat carrots. And maybe you got some animals that you can convince to do that. But our dog ain't going to do that. Our dog's going to eat meat. Why? Because it's her nature to do so. And she will reject the veggies. She will reject the carrots. She will reject the green beans, broccoli, and so forth. Because it's not in her nature to indulge in those things. Do you see where I'm going? As Christians who have genuinely been born again, who have genuinely experienced the death of Christ on their behalf, therefore His death becoming their death, and you are a new creation in Christ, that means by nature you no longer desire the filth of the world. That you will reject and resist that like my dog rejects baby carrots. And you might be sitting there saying, well, I know churches that are filled with all sorts of ungodly people doing terrible things. No, what you know of is a building filled with sinners who have convinced themselves that they are saved. You cannot 
love that which crucified Christ. Cannot. I heard one preacher put it this way. So many people believe that Christianity is really about avoiding all the evils that you really want to do. But that's not true. True Christians aren't sitting there saying, oh, I can't wait to look at porn. But I know I shouldn't. True Christians don't walk around saying, I can't wait to gossip about my brother and sister. They don't. And you're like, I know people who do who go to church. That's a whole different matter. Are you born again? Is his death your death? And if that is true, that means you have died to sin and you are walking in the newness of life and you no longer value or treasure the things of this fallen world. Now let's talk about his resurrection is our resurrection. Verses 5 through 9. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, he's progressing his argument, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. There's this resurrection language. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again, because, uh, again, death no longer rules over him. All right, stopping right there. So Paul continues. Not only is it true that his death is our death, his resurrection results in our resurrection. In our baptism, we spiritually die in Christ, but we do not remain in the water, right? It's not as if you just plunge down there and then you say there's something about you that has died. We also arise. We resurrect. His resurrection is our resurrection. Paul uses that expression in the likeness of his resurrection. What is the ultimate fate of all those who are in Christ? That we will experience the resurrecting power of Jesus. What was true of him thousands of years ago will be true of us in the future whenever that day comes. Our old self died in Christ and this means that the power of sin is rendered powerless. And this means we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Before coming to Jesus, sin was our master. Be aware of that. And we obeyed our evil inclinations. Consider Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world. According to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. This is descriptive of those who are still outside of Christ. That you are still obeying your fallen nature. You are still inclined towards sin. You might think that you are a good person by your own standards. But by God's standards, you are dead in your trespasses. You are truly spiritually dead. Incapable of saving yourself. Incapable of doing any good deed that God considers good. But this is not true of those who have experienced the resurrecting power of Christ. Listen to the promise to those who have died in Christ. We will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Why? Death no longer rules over him. In his humiliation, when Christ, the pre-existent Christ, came into humanity, added humanity to himself, he made himself vulnerable to death. 
among other things as well. Getting sick, getting tired, getting thirsty, and things like that. But ultimately, the greatest sign that Jesus Christ was in fact God in the flesh, God man, was that as a man, he did in fact die. And so while during his earthly ministry, death did have dominion over him because he allowed it to. But in his resurrection, he has declared that death cannot hold him, does not have victory, and Jesus Christ took the keys of death and destroyed the works of the devil. Now, Romans 8, 10 through 11 says this, If that is true of Jesus, then that is also true of us, to paraphrase what we are about to read. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Your physical body will die one of these days because sin has racked creation. But the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. To paraphrase, the power of the Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus Christ will be that same power that resurrects those who die in Christ. His resurrection is our resurrection. That's what Christianity... See, we always kind of flippantly say, that, oh, we're just going to die and go to heaven, whatever that means. But the Bible makes it clear that when we look at Jesus as the resurrected Jesus, we get a glimpse into what we will become. And we get a glimpse of that here. And one clear thing is this. Death does not have authority over the Christian. Oh, sure. Our bodies will collapse. Our bodies will one of these days die. But death will not have the final say over us because of the works of Jesus. Now, you might be asking, how can this be? How can a spiritually dead person who do nothing for their salvation hope to attain salvation? That, that's a good question, especially in light of Ephesians chapter 2 when it says you're dead in your trespasses. And as an unbeliever, you're inclined only to do evil. How can you hope to have any type of salvation if you cannot work for it? Well, here's a good illustration. This is a great illustration. Shortly after Janie and I got married, it was discovered that someone had actually stolen her deceased grandmother's identity. It's weird. And that this individual who stole her grandmother's identity went out and bought a car with all of her information. And, of course, they didn't realize that it had been done because you don't think of your grandmother who has died going out to buy things. And so they called the people who were in charge, who were overseeing this. And the question that they just wanted to make clear is this. How can someone who is dead, who is deceased, purchase or do anything at all? This is the response Someone who is alive is acting on your deceased loved one's behalf. You hear that? The way that her grandmother from the grave was able to do anything at all was because someone who was alive was acting on their behalf. Though you are spiritually dead in your trespasses, you can have hope, you can have salvation because a living God acted on your behalf. That is how it is possible for those who are dead in their sins ever believe that they can be alive and have any hope at all. That is the glorious power of Jesus' resurrection. A living God acting on the behalf of of dead sinners. His resurrection is our resurrection. And then finally, his life is our life. Let's look at verses 10 through 14 one more time. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, 
he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. And finally, his life is our life. In Jesus' one completed act, he died to sin once for all time. Do not expect Jesus to die for sin again. He will not allow himself to be subject to that ridicule to be spit on again. The offering, the sacrifice that he's making now is the one and done deal. And that's the one you need to be looking for. Not for anything else. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So one final act in the past leads up to a continuous lifestyle that Jesus continues to live to the glory of his Father. So what does it look like for Christians, for believers, to live out this type of life? Paul gives us a series of commands here. First, you need to change your mentality. Those who are genuinely born again, you need to have a correct understanding of who you are because there is an identity crisis among Christians. It says this, you two consider yourselves, consider yourselves, look at yourself, understand this about yourself as being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Listen, hear me on this. This is something I want to push back on. It's a common thing that people say, well, I'm just a sinner like everyone else. That This is Christians talker. I'm just a sinner like everyone else. I ain't no different from anyone else. Now, I don't know why they say that. The only thing I can suspect is that they don't want any type of responsibility to be put on them. Any type of accountability. If you publicly declare that you're a sinner, people don't expect things from you, right? Especially if you go to church. But are Christian sinners... Don't confuse, be confused on this. Do Christians commit sin? Yes. But positionally speaking, our status in Christ is that we are not sinners. If we are positionally speaking sinners in the eyes of God, we would go to hell. For that is what he does with sinners. What we are, positionally speaking, are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Listen to me, Christian. If you don't understand this about yourself, you will constantly excuse your sinful behavior. You will. Well, I'm no better and different, blah, blah, blah. You are. You are holy. You are children of God. You have a changed nature. And positionally, you were once over here dead to sin. But by the grace of God, you were brought over here. A different position, status in Christ. That's why Paul says you must understand this about yourself. You must consider yourselves dead to sin. Not proudly wear the label, but you are dead to it. And a lie to God in Christ. And so you need to change your mentality. If you are living in Christ, you need to have a change of mentality. And of course, second, you need to have a change of your behavior. Do not, he says, let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not offer any parts of it, your body, of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. So yes, it is possible for Christians to sin, but since we have been freed from sin, it is now possible to abstain from sin. That we no longer are obligated to do it because of our fallen nature. Now that we have a redeemed nature, every time sin presents itself, we could have chosen otherwise. We could have said no. And that's why Paul is sitting there saying, don't let your body be subject 
to your old self because your old self is slowly dying. But it doesn't mean that old man can't rear his ugly head from time to time to tempt you and to coerce you. But Paul says, ah, but now you have the power and the authority to rebuke that and no longer walk in it. Do not give your body over to evil things. Do not give your body over to sexual immorality. Do not give your body over to violence. Do not give your body over to laziness. Do not give your body over to neglect and only come to church on Easter. But give your body over to the glory of God. Turn away from sexual immorality. Stop slandering. Enjoy the disciplines of the Lord. Prayer. Loving your neighbor. Fellowship. Digging into God's word to know him more. Your body is to be in service of the spirit, not the fallen flesh. So you must change your behavior if indeed you are someone who is alive in God. Lastly, change your master. Change your master, it says, for sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but grace. Everybody here has a master. Uh, I know that People out in the world like to declare the autonomy. They like to say, I, I'm, no one's my master. I only answer to myself, that's not true. Everyone knows that they have compulsions that they wish that they could get rid of. Right? Everybody does that. And if you don't believe me, just wait till January 1st when you're hearing everybody's New Year's resolutions. That is people admitting that there are certain things about themselves they have not mastered. You are enslaved to something. Whether it be some specific sin or vice, there is something that controls you. So don't come out of here this morning saying, well, he's wrong about that. I'm my own master. Sure you are. Me too, being 50 pounds overweight. We are not autonomous. We do not even have power over ourselves. We all the time say things that we didn't wish we could not say think things that we wish we could not think because we are not our masters. But God has freed us from sin. God has freed us from the consequences of the law. That's what it means that you're no longer under the law but under grace. He's not saying get rid of the Ten Commandments. What he is saying is that the Ten Commandments doesn't have a, a, a justice over you or a punishment over you anymore. You've been freed from that. We have a new master. And that is Jesus the Christ. Turn away from sin because it no longer has authority of you. Galatians 5, 1 says this. For freedom, Christ has set us free. What does it mean? To be free in Christ, but he's also our master. It means we are free to be obedient. It means we are free now to please God. And you're like, wait, as a sinner, as a lost person, am I able to please God? No. Not ultimately. Can you do good things from time to time? Absolutely. But God does not look at that as like points towards your salvation. And so you are not good in that respect. And you are not free to please God. But if you are in Christ and God lives in you, you now have the power. You now have the ability to freely please him and obey him. That's what it means to have freedom. And so Paul wants them to understand this because at times Christians want to go back to the old master, right? Kind of like when the Jews left Egypt wandering out in the wilderness after experiencing all the wonderful miracles, even then some of them grumbled and said, at least we were having steak and potatoes in Egypt. Let's go back to Egypt. You mean the people who enslaved you, who beat you and robbed you of your identity and killed your children? You want that? Yes. That's ridiculous. And yet Christians do it all the time in their own behavior. That's a sin. The sin that brought you so much distress, robbed you of happiness and assurance in Christ, we still from time to time want to act like it's our master. There was a time I used to work at Blockbuster Video. Rest in peace, right? It's gone now. And while I was under their employment, I had to do what Paul, who was my manager, had to say. I was obligated to listen to him. Because he had authority over me. 
But that's not true anymore because not only did I move on to a different job, now Blockbuster no longer exists. Now imagine how odd it would be if you were to drive by an empty Blockbuster store and you see me inside still caring about Blockbuster work. And you come inside and say, Seth, what in the world are you doing in here? And my response is, well, I got a job to do. I don't want to make the boss mad. I don't want to shirk my responsibilities to Blockbuster. Their response should be, but Blockbuster doesn't have that kind of authority over you anymore. You don't have to do what they say anymore. They cannot get you in trouble for not putting the movies back on the rack in a timely fashion. Blockbuster is dead. See, Christians, the same thing. It, it just breaks my heart to see Christians want to go back to the old master as if it has some type of authority over them, as if they have pledged their allegiance to their old ways. I don't see many high schoolers who graduate dying to go back into the system in hopes to have principals and teachers overseeing them anymore. They're ready to run away and break loose because they are free. Christian, it's the same mentality. You have graduated. That which had ownership over you is now gone. And it's not because of anything good about you. It's because his story is our story. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. His life is our life. Now, I want to end on this. There's a couple of times in this text, it uses conditional statements. You know what I mean by that? If you do this, then that will happen. That's a conditional statement. When you're reading the Bible and you look for the words like if, in other words, all these promises I just spoke of do not automatically apply to every human being. What it means is this. It applies to you if, right? If we have been united in the likeness of his death, these promises apply to you. If we died with Christ, these promises apply to you. But if you have not met that condition, then they do not apply to you. And so if you are here this morning, you hear because someone maybe poked and prodded you and says, you need to be in East, you need to be in church. It's Easter. Maybe you're a husband and your wife convinced you to come. Maybe you're a young man, maybe you're a teenager, whoever it may be, yet you're here because something else. If you're here this morning and you're outside of Christ, his story is not your story. If you are outside of Christ, the benefits of his death, burial, and resurrection do not give benefit you at all. You must repent of your sins. You must turn to Jesus Christ and his good works by faith and you can have eternal life, then all these wonderful truths of death having no dominion, that there will be a day in which the saints are gloriously resurrected, will be applied to you. That the good works of Jesus are applied to your account. His righteousness becomes your righteousness. Our musicians are going to help out I do appeal to you, if you are outside of Christ, come to the altar and pray with me. And I will help you out. I will help you have a better understanding of what the gospel is. But at the same time, that's, that's just carpet. That's just steps. If you want to come and talk to me afterwards, pull me aside. I, I will skip Sunday school for you. I will make sure that you do indeed have a correct understanding of what it means to be a Christian and I will help you and answer any questions you may have. But the only thing you should not do is ignore everything I just said. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, you just wasted an hour.
You really did. So come to the altar. Respond to the gospel. Give your life to Christ, Ms. Roxanne.